the end of the last part of this video lecture, I posed this question about you pushing a filing cabinet and then stopping, and you were to choose the correct free body diagrams for just before you stop pushing and for just after you stop pushing. And if you're doing this through Moodle, then you already know that the correct answer is D. And this is in some sense mostly about inertia. Right? You know that if you're pushing the filing cabinet at constant velocity, then the acceleration is zero and the vector sum of all the forces has to be zero. And so that just tells you that the force that you're exerting must equal the magnitude of the kinetic friction force. And then after you stop pushing, the cabinet will keep sliding for at least a very short amount of time it accelerates to rest because of the kinetic friction. The thing that's sort of new is that the kinetic friction force is constant. It doesn't care how hard you push on the cabinet. It's just an interaction between the surface and the cabinet that is steady in strength. Now let's understand why the static friction and the kinetic friction work so differently. And to start, we're going to look at a completely different force. We're going to look at the perpendicular force between, say, a plank and a brick sitting on that plank, because it turns out that it behaves rather similarly to frictional forces. So imagine that the brick is just sitting on the plank, and we know that there's an upward perpendicular force due to the plank acting on the brick, and that it balances the downward gravitational force on the brick. Now, if you press down a little bit on the brick, then the upward force by the plank has to increase because the acceleration of the brick is zero, and so the vector sum of forces still has to be zero. And so that force increases to maintain a vector sum of forces equaling zero. If it didn't, then either the brick would accelerate down through the plank, or it would accelerate up off of the plank. We certainly don't expect either of those things to happen. If you press harder, then it'll increase further. And note that the plank is bending. It was actually bent a little bit right at the beginning just because of the brick sitting on it. But you probably wouldn't notice until you'd pressed rather hard down on it. But these are all def reversible deformations of the plank. If you take your hand off, it'll restore to being approximately straight. However, if you press very hard, you may be able to break the plank, and that is clearly an irreversible process. At that point, the upward perpendicular force due to the plank ceases to exist. The frictional force actually works almost exactly the same way, so let's go back to the brick on the plank and you not pressing on it. But now we're going to have to think about how things look at the microscopic level at the interface between the brick and the plank, where they are in contact, but they're only in contact over a very small fraction of their surfaces. Even seemingly smooth surfaces are actually quite rough on the microscopic scale. And now as I go forward, I'm going to omit the vertical forces for simplicity and clarity. So we can just focus on the forces that your hand is exerting horizontally and that the plank will exert back horizontally on the brick. So first, when you start to push a little bit, there is a horizontal static friction force that exactly balances the force that your hand is exerting. And if you press a little harder, that static friction increases to compensate. Again, the vector sum of forces is being maintained at zero by this force. And there's still deformation, reversible deformation occurring, but you would probably never notice it because it's going on at the microscopic scale of the surfaces. But now exactly the same thing happens as before. If you press very hard, then the surfaces actually break. They start, they start chipping and gouging each other and causing irreversible state changes. And this is what the kinetic friction is. The two surfaces are now sort of skipping over each other, occasionally bouncing off of each other and doing damage to each other as they do so. In the case of the perpendicular force, when the 
plank broke, that force disappeared entirely because the plank would have fallen away and no longer been in contact with the brick. With the friction force, there's now intermittent contact between them, and so there is still a force. However, it's smaller than the force that was occurring when the two surfaces were in good contact. Additionally, there are various other things going on that are very complicated. When a static friction is acting between two surfaces, often those surfaces are actually weakly molecularly bound to each other with hydrogen bonding and all sorts of other things. And that's another part of the reason why the static friction force is larger at its largest limit than the kinetic friction that replaces it once the surfaces start sliding across each other. We have a rule that we established in the unit on work about system boundaries and friction, and we can now modify it slightly. Because what we've just seen is that kinetic friction causes irreversible state changes. In other words, there's thermal energy produced. And the problem we ran into is that if we put our system boundary along a surface where that's happening, then we don't know how much of the thermal energy ends up inside our system and how much of it ends outside of our system. And so it messes up our energy accounting. And so we should never do that. However, static friction causes reversible state changes. It's really just like a spring force. There's no thermal energy produced. And so if we have static friction acting along a system boundary, this causes no problem with our energy accounting. And so, for example, in an example we're about to look at with a box on a conveyor belt, it'll cause no trouble at all if we choose just the box to be our system. Because we can't have a system boundary with kinetic friction acting across it, we never have situations where kinetic friction does work on a system. But now the possibility exists for static friction to do work since we can have it act across a system boundary. So let's think about you walking and let's say you're speeding up, so you're accelerating forward. And the way you do that is that you push back against the ground and the ground pushes forward against you, and that's this force here, the force by the ground on you, which is a static friction. We want to know whether that force is doing work. Well, on the surface of it, it looks like perhaps it is, because you're accelerating, right? You are speeding up, and so you are gaining kinetic energy. Your delta K is greater than zero. However, you might find that a little fishy. Is, is the energy source for this the ground? Clearly not. That would be awfully nice if the ground would just speed you up without you exerting any effort, but that's not how it works. Well, think further about it. There's the point of application of the force at your foot. And as you take your step forward, that force is acting at that point of application, and because your foot is not slipping, that point of application doesn't move. And we already know that means that the force displacement vector is zero. And so this static friction does no work. Which actually, when you think about it, makes perfect sense, because the energy transformation going on here is not work by the ground causing you to speed up. It is chemical energy inside your body, which is being converted into kinetic energy. But let's look at another situation. Here's a box on a conveyor belt, and the conveyor belt is speeding up, and the box does not slip, so it's being carried along by the conveyor belt at the increasing speed of the conveyor belt. We know that the free body gut diagram for the box will have a perpendicular force by the conveyor belt and a gravitational force by the Earth. The box is speeding up, and the only way that's possible is if there's a force here to the right. And there's only one force that can possibly be, because the only thing it's in contact with is the conveyor belt. So this must be the frictional force by the conveyor belt, and because it's not slipping, this is a static friction. So static friction is causing the box to speed up. And does this force do work? 
Well, again, the point of application is at the point where the box is touching the conveyor belt. But this time, the point of application is moving along with the box. And so there is a non-zero force displacement vector in the direction of motion. And so that tells us right away that the friction is doing positive work. So we see that while we have to be careful about static friction sometimes and whether it does work, because frequently its point of application doesn't move, it's quite possible for a static friction force to do work 